I don't expect everybody to be <laughs> right on time. Given our track record, I do not expect it. So let me see. Let me just. Um... <clears throat> All right. I'm dropping the link in the uh, uh, link to the YouTube video in the chat stream again. There we go. All right. Okay. Uh, that should be live, and we're live. Um, I, by the way, I use the same meme for the other class. Um, I, it's a little bit, it's a little bit corny and sentimental, but I feel like we're at that end of the semester crap where we're all like really tired. And so I was just, you know, decided we needed to have a message of just some unconditional love from a frog, you know, sometimes, you just, sometimes you just need some of that in your life, you know, and, uh, I'm good with that. Oh, thanks, Walter. Uh, awesome. Um, okay, my friends, let's. Uh, so here's what we got going down. What's coming up? Um, <clears throat> I'm still figuring out what to do about a final because uh, one thing I know is that I don't want you don't want to take it, and I don't want to grade it. So I'm thinking about something that we can do. Um, bottom line for me is. Everybody, you know, if you've been keeping up on the golf stuff and being in class, you know, you're going to be okay. You're going to, if you've been doing those things, you're going to pass. Speaking of which, um, we're a little low on numbers, I think, still. I wanted to do a, uh, a quick review on, um, uh, a quick review on the midterm. I promised that I was going to do that. And, but I, I think I might wait just another minute or two, um, just for, uh, a few bodies to show up in the meantime. And I wanted to, we're going to hit activity diagrams, but in the meantime, I wanted to just hit a couple of things we had not hit. Um, let me see. And and by the way, uh, because we have the audio working now, um, you can verbally jump in. But I want I wanted to just know what your thought is about this. What do you think? Seeds wants the clock. Okay, give me give me your pros and cons. Let's let's do this kind of rapid fire. What do you what do you say? And and again, you can jump in audio um, since we are. It'll work and it'll record on YouTube. Um, also, by the way, I'm in casual casual Wednesday mode here today. So um, hope I'm hope I'm not underdressed for class. I know most of you are sitting around in your underwear. So. <laughs> um, okay, so let me see. Lance Seed said he wants clock. Lance said it's two thirty-five, not eleven oh five. What does that even mean? Oh, it's not the current time. Smart Alec. Um, Gunner said lots of effort for a result that takes too long to read. Nice aesthetic though. Okay, so right now, Gunner, you know, one point for um, Slytherin. Um, that resonates with with mine. I think it's clever. You know, it is five minutes past eleven. But but the problem is, as a as a clever aesthetic, as a as a um, as a gimmick, I like it. And as an aesthetic, I like it. As a practical clock, don't like it. One of the things you got to keep in mind when people are are using reading your code, looking at your design, looking at your UML documents, that there are different, sorry, cleaning my glasses, that there are different sort of cognitive modes. And when you look at like a clock face, you glance, and when you've done that enough times, you know, and I grew up in a world where there was only 
you know, uh, the, the old minute hand, second hand, hour hand, whatever. You glance at it, and at a glance, you you know what time it is. It's very, very quick. Or if it just simply says, do I even have one? Well, my, my phone, right? All of our phones does this, 236, right? There it is. And you see it, and you know it. Here, you've got to start going, it is five, five, no, minutes past, you know, and it's and you've got to take too much time. And even though, and this is a design principle, every I've talked about it before, but every step you force the user to take above and beyond um, zero, there's a drop off, there's a tail off, there's a drop off in engagement. Okay, so every if you put something in a in a cupboard and there's always something, there's some the thing you use should always be the least, the most often is the thing that should take the least effort to get to, okay? That's that's really the fundamental idea. Um, Lance clock failure, jiggity, it's cool decor, much too much, too much work to be useful, yeah. What would the top line say other than it is? <laughs> yeah, right, right, what's it, what's it gonna say? Uh, Lissastoma, <laughs> right, Cairo? Yeah, Lissastoma. Like I don't know what it what else it would say. Yeah, no, I don't know. It strikes me odd. Um, Seed says a little unseemly, but that's what makes it beautiful. Um, Landon prefers a normal clock. Yeah, yeah, right with you on that. If the clock face was much darker, so the lights were more readable at a glance, it would be better. Oh, agreed, agreed. That that sort of shiny glare competes with the the glow of the LEDs, right? Okay. So that's just one that we hadn't gotten to previously. Um, let me throw another one out at you, just for the grins, just for a happy time. Um, um, let me see. Oh, here's an interesting one. We just barely got through March Madness, right? Congrats to uh, who won everything? Kansas. Near congrats for the North Carolina Tar Heels, whatever that is. What do you think about this? What do you, what do you, is there anything here that is bugging you? I'll, I'll just tell you, I'm putting this up because there's some things here that are bugging me. Um, and I know that's kind of an open-ended question, and I'm kind of asking you to read my mind, maybe, which is not fair. But I just want to see if you see what I saw. You know how how a bracket works for the NCAA tournament, right? You've got West, East, Midwest, and South region. Poor North, man. North got screwed on this deal. Why isn't there a North instead of Midwest? Probably because North is like Canada. But what do you think? What jumps out? Of, remember, remember, you've got to be able to detect shiny objects and you got to detect squeaking doors. This is an exercise in looking at the squeaking doors. What say? Also, by the way, I'm quite confident that this was something that was ultimately designed or there was a design decision right at the last minute that came from a, an engineer, a developer. Okay, Riley's typing. Come on, save me, Riley. Or you can jump in, jump in audio if you'd like. Can you see my comment? Um, no, only I've got, oh, I'm a, I'm a dork. No, I'm an absolute dork. I hadn't scrolled down because oh. <laughs> dumb, dumb guy. Hold on, hold on. Now I got to look at it. I was it frozen like at the, the location for some of the games looks like a winner. Like how does Philadelphia beat Baylor, North Carolina? Uh, where are you at, Walter? If you look in the east, well, any of the brackets. Yeah. The location of the Sweet 16 games or the yep. Elite 8 games. 
It says it looks like Philadelphia won out of Baylor in North Carolina. No, that's an excellent point, right? It looks like when Gonzaga and Memphis played, San Francisco won. So it looks like it advances out like that because that's kind of what happens down here. Like if you look in Portland, right? St. Mary's, Indiana, St. Mary's advances, UCLA, Akron, UCLA advances, then Baylor, North Carolina, and Philadelphia advances. So you've got a, you have a mixed metaphor. That's an example of a mixed metaphor where the, you've, you've trained the, the viewer, the reader, right? <clears throat> to, you know, to perceive it as the winner goes out somewhere between, like these two go out and Baylor pops, North Carolina pops, and then Philadelphia pops. So some way of, of bracketizing that or, or bucketizing that, it's kind of natural to say these two games were in Portland or these three games were in Portland. These three games were in Buffalo, right? That's natural and doesn't, you know, because you're using basically the extra white space right here to get you that. Then you break the metaphor. That's a great observation, Walter. Um, let me tell you what the one that, that nagged me the most, that actually bugged me the most. Um, first of all, there's, there's a, it's really a cluttery feel, you know, if there was some way to, to do that. But the number one thing I, that bugged me was, um, and, and it was at a f- point in the tournament where, notice right here you've got in the, in the east, you see where my mouse is moving, right? UNC, 8 seed, you know, uh, and then UCLA. Then the date is right here, 325, like UNC versus UCLA on March 25th, right? And then you've got the exact same, it's not mirror image. You've got the exact same layout on the left side or on the right side. So you swap the metaphor. And by the way, I didn't, I didn't, uh, look at the other comments yet. Let me, let me just see some real quick, but notice, know what I'm talking about here. It's, it's, if you look at KU Providence, Kansas Providence, and then UNC UCLA, and notice that this kind of makes sense because Kansas was the winner here and Providence was the winner there. They come together and the winner pops out, right? That you're, it's a cascade. There's two and a winner pops out. There's two and a winner pops out. But when you when you come in from the right, it works. And then just nestled in here is when the game is. But on the left, it's like Baylor and Norfolk, Norfolk, a winner pops out. And then Baylor, North Carolina, winner pops out Philadelphia. But if you ignore that, now the winner pops out. Oh, the date is where the teams were by the little bracket extension here. But on the left, the teams are nestled here and the date is up there which means the metaphor of the teams meeting and one of them advancing is scrambled on the left side, but look, but works on the right side because they should have treated this as mirror image layout instead of identical layout because the actual bracket is a mirror image graphically, but you didn't do the representation of this text to match the mirror image. Um, I'm now looking back at your comments cause I'm, I'm figuring it out. Um, Walter said the location, right, right. Yeah. You've mentioned that one. Um, Riley said, why is an empty spot? The thing that stands out the most. Oh, are you Riley? Are you talking about that center box? Yeah, you know, I, I agree. I agree. It draws your eye and it's way in the future. That's the championship winner. Like, I don't know, but I agree. Um, yeah, William, region locations, east, west, south, midwest, could be placed differently. Very light font could get lost in all the text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree. Anyway, but that bugged me. This one, so I, I hadn't even noticed because I wasn't looking for it, what Walter mentioned um, and or what Riley had said. Um, but yeah, there's... You see these brackets every year, and this one just struck me as particularly bad. Okay, let me see if I've got another one I can, any others I can do. Let me see. Do 
here's another one a little bit like that. I don't think I showed this one to you yet. This is one of my real pet peeves in terms of design. It has a cool aesthetic. No, everything M is possible. No thing is no, nothing. Everything, nothing M is possible. Nothing is possible. The problem is it's non-deterministic. No, everything is. Yes, it's no, everything M is possible. It, it, it's, it just screws you up and there's no way to read that. I, I don't even know. If it's nothing is impossible and everything is possible, but there's nothing to guide you, you know, deterministically to that conclusion. And it as easily says nothing is possible and everything is impossible, depending upon how you decide to parse it. You know? Ah. Anyway, that one's just that gra that design is not possible right there. Uh, let me see. <laughs> okay, here's another one, actually. I could have used this one as a meme, but it also relates to a, a design principle. Okay. <laughs> I like this a lot. Can you tell I like this a lot? But what I like about it, first of all, I like the, I like the, you know, what is the what is the baboon thinking here? But no, here's an interesting thing. Um, this is a design principle that I've don't know if I've talked about. Wait, what is that seeds? What did you just drop in there? No, everything is possible. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, okay. Here's my principle and why I have the baboon about to whack a sleeping lion. Um, one of my kind of core design principles is every new feature has to start its life cycle kind of condemned to death. It has to start on death row. Somebody's like, oh, cause, cause what happens is every time you add a new thing, a new feature, you add complexity to the code, you add difficulty to maintainability and all the other things from an underlying code perspective, but you also do things to the interface to the to the overall experience most product most many many teams get into a mode where they start feeling like it's the next five features that are going to save us we're checking the boxes getting the features we have all the features therefore we win but that's actually not true what makes everybody win is the dopamine okay the minimum viable product is dopamine when the dopamine starts flowing then the user has an experience and every new feature that you add has got to take something away, almost always, not exclusively, but almost always is going to take something away from something you're already doing. You're going to clutter stuff up. You're going to have to suddenly bear, fragment an interface and bury the, the, the features, bury the interface, something you're going to have to do, okay, to, to add that feature. And you have to start with the assumption, assumption that adding the feature isn't worth it because of all the damage you're going to cause. So therefore the value you create by adding the feature has to overcome the inertia of what the damage is that you're gonna cause. Okay, does that make sense? Every, you have to overcome the inertia of the negative effect of adding the feature. Therefore, it's not good enough to say, hey, you know what would really be neat is if we had, you know, a this. That's not compelling enough. That's not compelling. You have to start by saying, that's going to screw a bunch of things up. What does it bring? What does it add? How, you know, how many people is this going to, you know, benefit, right? Okay. That's that one. Um, okay, I think we're getting close. Are there any others that are worth showing here? Oh, here's another good one. It relates to code. Check this one out. <laughs> this is the idea. This is the idea that 
that we we think it's clear in our heads right in the moment that we do it and then we come back later you know what i mean and you're just screwed so no wait so see you seriously did that i hope it was throwaway code and not actual work once named all of my variables some form of the word barf why did you do this because you know that's really really bad that's really bad practice um i knew of i knew somebody who had maintained code where the developer had decided to make uh, apparently it was somebody who was really excited about, maybe they were learning Spanish or something. So they made every variable, the name of an animal in Spanish. Like, do you understand that the hardest job in all of development, the hardest job is looking at code that you didn't write. You're getting some of this, right? By going through the, the head first design patterns book. One of the things you have to do is read code and then modify it, right? And, you know, add stuff to it. But you have to understand the code in order to do that. If the code's just called foobar xy temp, um, it's just brutally difficult to try to understand what it is they're trying to do. And the mental model is the critical deliverable. Um, nice. So, Seeds, you did this as a as a um, act of rebellion, Walter's example, uh, I can't think of a good variable name right now as an act of desperation. Yeah, with the right, Gunnar said, with those types of variable names, you need to build a dictionary to keep track of them all. Yeah, because you gotta have the code, the code should, so minus 20 for Hufflepuff, okay, Seeds, I'm sorry, but I mean, it's cool, cool story, cool confession, but bad, bad, bad evil bad practice even as an act of rebellion because the only person you punished was yourself because even when you were looking at your code you had to figure out which what steamy barf was and what slimy barf was you still overloaded yourself you know unnecessarily so that's some internal code principles um and i think i'm probably good with that let me see Anything else? Um, here's one more that's just in the I don't know what in the ever loving hell anybody was thinking. Uh, you know, I don't understand. That. <laughs> I, I can't. Okay, I didn't take this picture myself. Therefore, there's a big, big part of me that just says it can't be. It can't be real. Um, um, yeah, so seeds, man, if you literally named a function Tyson's son, you should be berated if that was at work, especially, um, Mike uh, right likes to write school assignments with the sketchiest code possible. Makes my what do you mean by sketchy, Mike? But also the problem is that you you do you get good at what you practice doing. That's the thing. Okay, let me see. Let me let me jump over to. Um, Let me see. Hang on a second. Where are we? Okay, are you ready for exam? This is uh, exam number one. Let me get rid of this. This is a, what I call the sort of poor man's histogram, okay? Just the, 
the the poor man's histogram it's not you know you don't need to do graphic things something you can just sort of learn this is um with a with a on the scale of one to 31 and these are the scores okay so one person got a 17 one got an 18 19 etc cetera, etc cetera. this is interesting the average i didn't even calculate the average but the average is somewhere I mean, we could, if somebody wanted to do it real quick, um, you've got eight at 31, six. Well, somebody want to just do this? Eight at 31, six at 30, two at 29, four at 28, and then one each of these guys, and there's a grand total of five, six, seven, 19, 27. Somebody want to do the quick average on that? For 27 bodies. William said 27 is the average on canvas. I, okay, I'll buy that. I mean, so the, the mean. No, nah, that can't be, man. Of course, these pull it down quite a ways by in terms of average. Okay, so the, this is an example where you've got a skewed distribution. And the average, it doesn't really tell you. There's You're, try, you're trying to find the sort of the central... The central tendency, and when you have non-normal data, oh yeah, no, you can't you can't include the zeros. Okay, let's just do this thing. Let's do it ourselves. Um, what have I got? Eight thirty ones. Hang on, I'm just gonna do it. I should have done this already. Um, Come on. I could have put these in a spreadsheet. Okay, and then 630. And then 29 times dose. And 28 times 4. And then we had... 25, 24, 22, 21, 19, 18, 17. And then what did I say the total count was? 27? No, I screwed everything up. Anyway. James, is that right? Are you run the numbers? Somebody run somebody run the numbers besides me. James is saying twenty seven point five. I screwed up my thing because I got I like was just going twenty seven five. Okay, yeah, no, that sounds about right. So this is about the average. Now, what's interesting is <clears throat> here's a little stats lesson for you. I think you should have had stats by now, but. With stats, you're trying to find this sort of measure of central tendency. What's the thing that describes the center of this thing? Well, in this case, the mean doesn't actually, right, Ali, the median will do that better. But if you have a normal distribution, then the mean is a reasonable, you know, representation. But if you've got a skewed distribution, it doesn't. So you've got this long tail up here. So you got 27. So you go down from the top until you get to 13 and a half. So this is 3, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So the median is actually 30 out of 31, the median, which means half the students in the class got 30 or above. And because we're down here at 14, you could say the other half of the class got below 30. But to have a median of whatever 30 out of 31 is, you know, it's 98% or something. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Okay. This is a, this is a really, this is great. Um, the other one that you have is a measure of tendency. Um, oh, thanks for the survey, Gunnar. Um, so tack on the, I am in this class and I have taken stats. Wait, that's the, the YN are on the long or on the wrong spot. Yeah. 97% is the median but the other the other thing you can look at is the mode 
which says the one value, uh, the one value that occurs most is 31. So 100% is the mode, 97% is the median, and then whatever, 27. So the other thing too is if you're down here, I looked at some of these, um, I mean, as I went back and reviewed, um, the number one thing that everybody who was down here did wrong <coughs> was probably, my guess, is one of two things. You really weren't watching or listening when I gave you the key to how to succeed on the exam, not just telling you what the questions are going to be, like not knowing the answer to a question when I read the exam to you. There's not a lot of room for forgiveness there. You know, unless just life took over and crapped all over you. And in that case, you know, it's the kind of thing you can talk to me about if something unusual happened. Um, you know, just school is hard and you got busy and got behind, you know, doesn't cut it. I mean, that's just the nature of this task. But, you know, my dog died. I got COVID. You know, there's stuff like that that actually happens. So, um, anyway. So at the end of the day, um, the number one thing I saw was people not using, not using their words, not just saying, you know, explain, talk to me, you know, go through it, explain it, articulate it, you know, that's bottom line. Yeah. So seeds, you know, just ping me if you really want to know then just ping me. Obviously the rest of the class doesn't care. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but yeah, definitely, you know, ping on that and I can take a look. Um, and by the way, when it comes to like looking at exams, just every, I hope you know by now, I hope you have know enough about my personality to know that I don't mind. Um, uh, I don't mind giving back points. You know I mean? I'm not, I'm not flawless. And if you have, you know, a, you know, something that I wasn't aware of or that I look, take another look, you know, I, I, I really don't mind a little grade grubbing. Um, I don't know if, if you're, if you, if you said five words in answer to an essay question that starts with the word discuss and you wrote one sentence and then you, you know, if you, then you sit around pissing and moaning you know, I'm not impressed with that approach, but I really don't mind the honest, like, hey, is this, uh, you know, what do I, what do I not understand here? You know, I don't mind in the least. So, okay, enough of that. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about activity diagrams some more. And then next week we go, no, we're going to talk about, well, yeah, we're actually ahead because it's the 13th. And we talked about state diagrams. We're going to talk about activity diagrams. Okay. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, oh, there were, so Canute, there were, there were people who did like, you know, the question says explain or discuss. And there are people that did like one sentence as if it were, you know, a super, super short answer. If it says discuss, I mean, like we talked about this. We talked, I mean, I did tell you specifically not to do that. Exactly right. So, you know, if you did, <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't own that. You know, I cannot own that. All right. Um, let's see. Let's jump down to, let's go back to activity diagrams. Um, wait, was there one more that I wanted to do? By the way, I mean, I hope, I hope this whole thing has been a good experience. You know, I know it's been a little bit all over the map in terms of design and in terms of, you know, things that we're talking about. And, you know, I don't know how much of that, you know, feels like it doesn't make sense or it's been, you know, sort of random, but hopefully not, hopefully not crazy. Um, you know, I mean, it's been my intent anyway, to try to mix it up, keep it a little fresh because it can get really boring sometimes. 
I think as you know. Um, all right, Seeds, I've got your, I see your DM. And uh, I'll see if I can look at that like right, right after class. But if I lose track, Seeds, would you ping me, please? Yeah, just to make sure that I, I mean, obviously the half point's not going to kill you more than likely, but yeah, just definitely. Yeah. Appreciate it, Tyson. Um, okay. What am I looking for? Looking for Activity diagrams. Okay. I, you're going to like this. I command you to like this. You shall like this. No, I think you will. I think you will. Um, remember that we, I'll bring it up and we'll do it like the quick review. I'm just being slow waiting. I, I just opened the PowerPoint slides. So I should have had it opened already. Okay. Activity. Now we did these already. Let me do the quick review. Okay. Looking at my big screen. Um, we talked about how that's kind of like flow charts, but you can do parallelism, right? We, we talked about this. We did. We went through this whole thing, I think. Um, decomposing an action and swim lanes. So you can kind of like, you know, coordinate. Uh, you, it invites you to do a bunch of things. When you think about swim lanes, you know, this notion of what, what design issues does this lead you to think about, you know, and what organizations of the software does it make you think about? Like maybe these are objects, maybe fulfillment is a certain thing and finance is a certain thing and you know etc and then i don't know if we talked about signals i don't care too much other than just to say like the notation i don't care but i do want to say that that there are there is the ability to say a signal a time signal for example it's two hours before flight pack your bags yeah i think you should have your bags packed more than two hours before your flight leaves um you know, and there are signals that are like initiating and signals that are like a receipt of a signal. That's all I really want to say about that. And they can, so they can originally originate outside the system and can be accepted to create a trigger. And they can also originate within the system and can be sent to an entity outside the system. And the system itself could be a subsystem, right? So one system within your software could be sending a signal to another system. I don't really care that much for these for these notations. I don't know what I would do better or different, you know, different. I can't say that I would, you know, so I'm just being a, a hypocrite. Okay, this expansion reads, the problem is now you start to get into features that start to look like code. And I don't want to get, I don't want to delve in too much, but you could think of this as, as iteration or concurrency, okay? Um, where it's like, you know, for each of these list of topics, you're going to write an article, review an article, and publish a newsletter. You'll do it's like it's like iteration, is what that's trying to be. You can represent that. Um, similar thing where you can have a you know little flow final. I don't care too much, and I can do a join where there's a boolean expression that 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 is all here in notation. You know. If they, if they select a drink and you've got the coins that are greater than or equal to the price of the drink, you can dispense the drink, that kind of idea. Okay, so here's the things I want to just say. Two things and then I want to do examples, okay? <clears throat> and then I want your feedback. And this is going to be kind of cool. Gunner is correct. There is no free will in this class. Lance refuses to like it on principle. Sorry, Lance. Lance also will refuse to come to Nico's on principle. <laughs> Isn't that right, Lance? You know it's true. Um, okay, here's our summary. Two slides of summary, and then I've got a few examples, about half a dozen. Okay? So these are the big support, the big strengths. There is support for parallelism, right? I can represent like a flowchart, but I can split it and, and represent... Um, oh, what's that? What's happening with my, oh, am I, am I, am I, is my frog in the way? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Thanks for the heads up on that, man. 
seeds. Yes, yes, yes. I can, in fact, do that. Oops. Um, hang on a second. Well, what I can actually do is I can shrink the froggy. I'll shrink the frog. How about? Works. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll shrink the frog. Isn't the frog cute, though? Doesn't the frog just warm? There's an old expression about warming the cockles of your heart. Go look that up. But uh, the frog, man, the frog just warms my little heart. Um, yeah, small frog, too big for slides. Ah, uh, Gunner. I think Gunner might be winning the chat so far just with that one. Um, okay, parallelism. Uh, this is just put it in your unrelated facts and information booklet, not commonly used for concurrent systems, uh, even though there is support for parallelism. I don't want to get too much into that. Um, it's most useful when it's modeling workflow, right? And here's the defin a, def a definition of workflow. The sequence of industrial, administrative, or other processes through which a piece of work passes from initiation to completion. So in other words, it's really more about the data moving through. It's more like a data flow diagram, okay? And it turns out, um, it turns out that not everything looks and acts like workflow. Not everything work, you know, looks and acts like data flow, right? If you start doing, you know, things that are kind of big data, data infrastructure, the kinds of stuff that I'm be doing at uh, at SoFi, then it becomes a more relevant issue. Um, kind of a closing little uh, perspective about the UML. Um, once again. It's easy to hate UML with all the persnickety little details. Um, the value lies in the representational power. Again, this, I swear, if all this UML, if all you remembered, this is the thing that I would wish you could remember. That in, that the, the value lies in its representational power and in the thoughts it induces you to have about design. I'm reading this slide, can you tell? software engineering, every aspect of product creation and deployment. So it's the fact that the that UML teaches you about design. That's the bottom line, okay? Um, and then let's talk about, let's do some examples. Now this is one, this is audience participation, okay? We got about a half hour, so it's about five minutes for each one. Okay, talk to me. And and again, you can do this. Um, you can do this verbally, and it will you know be on YouTube, or you can do this thing text. Talk to me. What do you think? Pros and cons. What do you like? What do you not like? I'm waiting. This is you. Uh, I don't like that I can barely read it. You know, that's a thing. Yes, absolutely. That white on. Well, and the th interesting thing is, and I'm kind of staring at it on the big screen, kind of blown up, and it's still hard for me. But what's interesting is, of course, the darker the background. Like this says ticket slash email submitted by customer. This says end. When you get to white Absolutely on yellow resolution but i can't read i can't even read the black on white like that middle diamond that is ticket oh, assigned maybe oh during oh uh, yeah is so, ticket assigned yeah black okay. and white so I can barely, barely yeah read. so you got a serious readability problem there's no question but when you go like white text on yellow now you're just now you're just messing okay yeah so that's fair totally fair yeah um next thing uh seth says he can't read it Alex says the colors are painful. So wait, let me see. Let me, I'm going back. Seed says it hurts hurts his eyes. Seth said hard to read. Alex said colors are painful. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about colors. Um, Jiggly said colors and fonts are bad. 
Lance said, is there any meaning to the colors? Let's talk about colors. Uh, Seth said, between the stream quality and the color settings, it's not good. What about the colors? What do the colors mean? Let me, let me walk through and read these to you a little bit. This kind of burgundy matches. These two are both the same color. They're burgundy. And this one is the ticket submitted by customer, and this one is end. There's also an inconsistency. By the way, these were all diagrams I found in the wild, okay? First of all, email submitted, why say the mode of delivery? It's a ticket, no matter how it came, through a system, via email, whatever. But also ticket submitted by customer, how about ticket resolved instead of end? You know what I mean? Or beginning, there's, there's inconsistency in how these are treated. Now we go red. What else? It said support case is created and assigned. What else? is red so you can see it clearly enough nothing is red nothing else is red then we've got this one which is clear triangle with a reddish it's kind of burgundy from where i'm sitting anyway and then i've got this these triangles which are questions yes no also by the way we don't normally come into these and then pop straight out the bottom and then split Usually you'd come in, see a hero where it's like, yes and no, go out different corners. Yes and no, go out different corners. So here you've got yes is out the right and no is out the bottom. Yes is out the left and no is out the bottom. Here, everything goes out the bottom and then it splits in a decision after it leaves. That's not even using the diamond correctly. Then these guys are, as far as I can tell, both orange-ish but I can't tell if they're the same orange. They seem to match these guys, but why is the outline different colors? These guys are orange. This one, this one, and then this one down here. This one is a lighter orange, and this one, these two are yellow. Like there's literally, <clears throat> fetch man, there's three decision boxes and two different colors. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, other states and one, two, three, four, five different colors. There's no representational power when every box has a different color. <sighs> um, let me see. Seth said we need high contrast text settings. Gunner got us got to stream SVGs rather than pictures. Yeah. But still, this should survive. Riley, is this some kind of coloring thing representing stack depth? Uh, I don't know. I mean, interesting question, but I don't know. Alex dropping the contrast checker for accessibility. Riley said, you start at red, go to orange, go to yellow, back to orange, and back to red. Ah, okay, so you're saying, it's like, if you view it a little like a heat map, it's going, I don't know, it could be like higher to lower or lower to higher, and then coming back out? Yes. <laughs> Even with the contrast checker, we're okay with that, because like everything except for the yellow and the white, but the, the white on the burgundy, the red, the orange, all of those would pass a contrast checker. The font's not large enough. It's like they went with the thinnest possible font. Yep. Now, what they one of the mistakes is, uh, it's too many words. Like down here on the right, it says, it says ticket is reviewed based on priority by support team. You don't need to put all of that information into this box. You could have, for example, ticket is reviewed or ticket review. Then you have a accompanying document that tells you ticket review is based on what priority? Tell me about the priority. Tell me, you know, document the process. So I got a high level glance, then detail, busting it out. And this is what happens when you try to put too many words into your diagram. Also, when you're doing these kinds of diagrams, is ticket assigned? You don't need the word is. Ticket assigned, question mark? Issue resolved, question mark? You don't need was and is. You know, remind, reminder, remind, reminder is sent. How about just reminder sent? Ticket reviewed. Support 
team resolves issues. Issue resolved or issue attempted to be resolved, something. Anyway, <clears throat> and by the way, none of these are UML. And this is also the point. When I went looking for documents, typically in open source projects is the best place to find documents. If you're looking for examples of what other people have done, go hit the UML-ish documents on, on, open source, uh, on open source projects. Okay, I'm done with this one. Let's move on. That one's but ugly. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Look at that. Just scout it for a minute. I don't really care if we get all the way through these um, today. You know, but we'll just take whatever we got here to enjoy. First impressions. Seeds. I'd code that. <laughs> Landon says it's better than the last one, and it's a little hard to disagree with that. Seth likes the color scheme, but Seth, you got to defend the color scheme. And I also want you to you just defend, Seth, I'm serious about this. You said color scheme. Is there a color scheme or are there just colors? Landon said it appears deterministic. Okay. What else? Seeded cooling crystallization workflow. Oh, man. Gunnar said uh, he likes that there's a key for some lengthier text. Yeah. No, I do like that, right? I, 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 I don't know if I like this diamond with the word key in it because I think it clutters all the other diamonds, but the notion that there's just decision one, but you say what decision one is. Solvents with suitable properties for cooling crystallization. So it's at least that thing I was talking about where you put sort of less text, in this case, no text in the box other than decision one, decision two. But what about this? If the diamonds mean decisions, do you have to say the word decision every time, right? One of the principles of design is don't say things you get for free. Diamonds in workflow diagrams say decision, that they are used for decisions. And you've got also this right here. You can put diamond with key now and then just say decision one, decision two, you know? Or you could say in, in diamonds, you know, decisions or something to convey it so you could create less clutter with just one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, what else? Um, yeah, Gunnar said, rather than forcing it into the same box. What else? Okay, I'm still waiting for Seth to defend the so-called color scheme. Okay, Seth, I'm calling you out, man. There are seven stages, right? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is it clear? Uh-huh. Okay. So we've got blue and yellow, and one and two, they go to three. And then we're going to switch to a, a red scheme. So you've got stage four is red, stage five is purple, stage six is, it looks bluish. So that's also a combination. And then yellow shows that there's a, so from stage two, right before the beginning and end. So you've got a yellow before the beginning and end. So stage two and seven are both yellow. And then the goal is what all the stages are leading to. So that color is also there. Okay. So it is a scheme. But it's well, a convoluted scheme. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, don't backtrack. Remember, you know, in these classes, you know, when I'm teaching these classes, you, I'm not the ultimate authority here. But I will say this, and maybe the resolution comes through better. Obviously, I'm like on the screen, right? And you're seeing it through the stream. But there are seven stages and eight if you include the goal. And there are eight different colors. You know, so unless there is an evolution of colors, getting light, like, like, right. It was a Riley that pointed out, you know, maybe that there was like a, like a heat map or whatever here. Cause this stage seven is a darker yellow than this stage two. And then there's this light blue aqua it's, green. 
it's pinkish. the it's the combination of colors to reach that stage. So what you, does that even mean, you, though, Seth? Like stage one and stage two lead you to decision one, and decision one leads you to stage three. So you combine those two stages to get the green from the blue and the yellow. To get the green. So stage three is I'm, green because when a tour. I'm noodling really hard on that. So you're you're suggesting so. you're suggesting the old standby primary colors mixing color scheme. Yep, no, makes I don't it easy know. to read. I don't know. I see what you're saying. And it works for one, two, and three. And then I think it just breaks to hell after that. Well, then you combine the red and the blue to get purple. And stage six is kind of whitish and bluish. And so that would narrow down the, uh, the yellow. I'm just, I'm just elaborating no. on nothing right now. Hey, man, no, but I get it. It kind of works. No, I asked you to go bold, you know. <clears throat> the other thing, too, Seth, and I doubt you would take this bet, but if we could actually talk to the people who built this graphic, I would bet you $100 hard cash bones that they weren't thinking of anything like that and they were just looking for different colors that they liked and i have I no way you a hundred dollars it was automatically generated based on a predetermined <laughs> set of colors when they created this okay that's a slight alteration on the bet it's a variant of it wasn't deliberate on their part but um i would take that bet for 10 bucks but notice that my confidence is lower the notion that they just picked random colors, but these are nice sort of pastelish colors, suggesting that there may have been a, a palette that they were choosing from. I don't know. I don't know. All right. All right. Um, I do like, so thanks for going bold, Seth. You know, I always respect that, you know, even, even if I'm not, I don't know if I'm persuaded, but I'm not, you know, totally dissuaded either. Um, let me see. Yeah, Walter said for red green colorblind, yes and no are the same color. Yes, excellent point. Because I was about to say that yes is at least green, kind of. Well, it's green for go, but it's not the green for go green. It's more of a funky pastelish green. And then this no is more of a pinkish, I don't even know what that color is, salmon ish. No. And if you're red green color, are you red green color blind, Walter? But if for the red green color blind, you got nothing, right? Um, Riley said colors are a bad idea for an organizational system in general because of how many people have some form of color blindness. Yeah, I agree. And put it this way: if it can clarify, what percentage of the population is color blind? Riley, would you mind just checking that real quick and dropping it? I'm just curious. I would bet it's something like 10%, but I wouldn't be shocked if it was bigger than that. But of course, you know, you try to be as inclusive as you can, right? With accessibility. Um, but I'm a fan of 8% are colorblind. So 92% of the population is not colorblind. Okay. 8% of men and about a half percent of women. Interesting. Okay. So there's a uh, fundamental sort of retinal. Well, and uh, um, well, no, I think I know why as well. The the rods and cone distribution in the retinas of biological men and women are different, and I and I would imagine that that has something to do with um, that. Different. I did not know that different. Uh, oh, it's a recessive X-linked gene, so genetics come into play. Okay, all right, cool. Yeah. So what's interesting is. You know, even if it's just 8% of the population, you know, you try to say, well, we don't want those folks to be like, sucks to be you. You don't get to read the document, you know, and, and then, you know, that person just happens to be your, your lead architect, you know, it, it, you know, you can't do that. You can't do that. So I like the idea of having color to supplement or to augment and, um, but not to stand alone. And in this case, it does augment in the sense that it says yes and no. But the other thing, which is easier to read, yes or no? I'm going to say, I'll go bold here. I'm going to say that no is easier to read than yes. <clears throat> yeah, because I think the, that reddish is a little darker. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, 
All right. What else do you think? I agree that it's better. I agree that it's significantly better than the last one. <clears throat> so Riley was just suggesting that since there's a one in 12, uh, about one in 12 men have some form of color blindness with an even distribution of men and women, one person in a 24 person team would have color blindness on average. Excellent. Um, so I like the fact that the words are summaries and that they're supplementing. Okay, let me go. Should we go to the next one? By the way, how do you fix these things? How do you fix them? Do you remember the early discussions we had in January? What sucks? It's squeaking doors. It's shiny objects and it's squeaking doors. By the way, one thing I don't like about it is that it everything's bank and right for a while. Then the no cuts hard left back up to here. Then the yes is kicking out to the right. And then all of a sudden, yeses are going left and no's are going the other direction. If there's any way to create a flow so that success moves left to right, for example, that every move to the right is a success and all downers, all, all negative results are moves to the left, then you can intuitively see progress, no progress. Do you see what I mean? I think they have that flow. Like if, if you look at it, if you take out all the nose, it doesn't go like directly left to right the entire time, but it goes like it just kind of snakes all the way to the left and down all the way to the right, down. Yeah. Or it's all the way to the right, then all the way to the left, then all the way to the right. Agreed. And then Agreed. The nose and everywhere else. Which, right, right, right. And to your point, Walter, if we unsnaked it, and this is kind of what I'm saying. If you unsnaked it, then the, then that no, then the two nose in the middle line would be going left. So the nose would be going left, and then in the middle line they would be going left because you unsnaked it, right? Then you then the bottom one would stay the same, and the and the nose would in fact all go backwards, and the greens would all go forward. What I'm I have, so I'm totally agreeing with you, Walter. What I'm advocating is unsnaking it. You know. Maybe there's, but but then how do you do that graphically, right? How do you represent all of that? Does that make sense? You know, and I, I would say having a thing where it's like, especially with graphics, having a graphical representation that you can like click on and blow that one up to get better information. Then you can see just with like hardcore, la just labels, more terse labels. You know what I mean? So that would be an overview because right now you lose track. You lose track. Gunner's doing color. Okay, Gunner wins the Gunner, you win the chat. I I I tip I tip my hat to you, Gunner. Um but here's a question though, Gunner. <laughs> Does that confirm or deny Seth's theory of it confirms? It confirms? Seriously? Thatch. No, Seth just claimed confirmation. I want to know Gunner if Gunner says it confirms. <laughs> this is a highlight, man. <clears throat> Come on, Gunner, I need a yay or nay because I might owe Seth like a hundred bucks. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Gunner, I'm waiting, man. I'm waiting. I'm my, I'm, I'm uh, on the edge of my seat here, figuratively, because literally I'm not on the edge of my seat. Yeah, yeah. So, Wes, when, when you said, don't forget that you're dealing with additive color displays in human cones and rods. Right. I did mention the cones and rods in terms of, you know, color differences between men and women, biologic, fundamental biological genetic differences. Um where uh, where women have more cones, men have more rods, allowing women on on average, if you understand stats, it doesn't mean that you know that every woman ha is different from every man. Um, but it does mean that as a general distribution, 
um, there's a greater ability to discern color um, in women and a greater ability to discern motion in rods. Um, and, and therefore, uh, you'll see those differences uh, genetically, biologically manifested. Um, let me see. And I'm trusting you to understand stats enough to know that it doesn't mean, you know, that every woman can tell colors better than every man. This is not what that means. Um, okay. Gunner. <laughs> Gunner blows, saves me a hundred bucks and says the only thing that it confirms is that color math should not be attempted. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So Gunner says it does not confirm Sester. Okay. That's all I needed to know here at all. Thank you, Gunner. You, you're piling on now. You're getting extra credit on winning the chat. So well done. Well done, Gunner. Okay. What about this one? This is probably our last one for today. We'll pick these up again, you know, maybe what's today, Wednesday, we'll pick them up again, Monday. And I want to try to get through some stuff. I want to just, I want to try to see if we can get through next week. If we can't, then I only want to spill over to Monday the following week and not Wednesday, which is officially the last day of class. Official last day of the semester for this class is two weeks from today. I'd like to finish in three days, maybe less. And then I, I'm, I'm leaning pretty heavily on Nico's. We just have to figure out if there's a, if there's a time that's off, off peak so we don't slam them during a, during a lunchtime, dinner time. So we'll have to start thinking about how best to figure that out. But I am, I am leaning toward Nico's. Talk to me about this one. Again, not UML. <clears throat> this one, I think, is the suck. What do you say? What do you got? Seth is trying to automatically do it on Lucid Chart. <laughs> uh, yeah, James, we, we just need to figure out like when like when to do it when I've got to do the same thing with three with 305 G. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the diagram. You don't even know where to look, right? It doesn't guide you. This is the thing. Remember, remember the fundamental principle of design. Remember Phil Armour and remember Don Norman the idea that the device itself teaches you about its its usage well the the device itself um the so the graphic itself the diagram itself should guide you it should lead you now here let me let me give you one example of what i'm talking about the principle that i'm talking about here's what i'm talking about Check this out, and then tell me if your mind is like slightly blown. Okay, what do you think? What's the point? Mind just a little blown, right? Because you do it. You 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 go. You look at it. And you go. You will read this first, and then you will read this, then this one, and you will read this last. And you're like, dude, I just did exactly what it said I was gonna do. It's spooky, right? And it worked for me, worked on me, okay? This is an example of where the font, the size, the orientation, it, it draws your attention straight to the center and says to you, start here, right? White middle, then you go down, and then you double back up because it's small print, right? So what did Riley say? It's a perfect example of how design directs you while I, while also ex inspiring some sense of existential dread, explain yourself, sir. Um, bigger font seems closer and more important, right? It, it, it pulls you to read there first. Now, look at this bad boy and tell me what we should start with, where we should start. What's the first thing you see in this one? What's the very first thing your eyes drawn to? That, that you can latch on. The first thing I do is my mind grabs the center. Every color is different, by the way. Notice there's two, there's one, 
four, six, one, two, three, five, seven. So there's seven colors in a ziggy zaggy, whatever. They're all different colors. Then I see this triangle looks exactly like this triangle. I see that guy, this, these four repeating here and here and a little thumb. And this entire structure says, ignore me. Everything here is stupid. So the first thing, the very first thing that my brain latches onto to say maybe there's a clue for me here is the logo in the upper right-hand corner. And that's after I burn energy going, uh, 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 what is this thing anyway? Right? Horrible. Talk to me. What do you think? Um, let's see. Oh, Riley said it highlights how easily we can be influenced by something without even knowing it. Mm, good point. Absolutely. Uh, seeds sees the pretty images first. Seth, my eyes unfocused actually. Yes. My, I did the same thing as Seth. My eyes blurred. Like I, I went, uh, Wow. Cairo sees the blue column first. Riley sees the diamond. Now, do you see the problem? Okay, here's the problem. Go back to this. Everybody had the same experience because this graphic teaches you about how to read it. It teaches you to read that first, that second, that third, and that fourth. It teaches you that, right? This doesn't teach you, and therefore... Everybody, um, everybody looking at it. So Riley sees the diamonds. Seth zones out to the center, and then I look at the top right. So Seth and I have an identical reaction. Um, Landon started with the blue thing. I presume you mean the bar on the left. James looked at the left orange diamond first. Seeds has to focus hard on the thing to follow the arrows. They go in all directions. Yes. It's like, whoa, um, Walter had to look again to see what blue column you were talking about. Walter starts in the middle for some, I do too. And I think I start in the middle because nothing really draws my attention. Nothing guides me. And then Gunnar said, there's like a key along the bottom, but it's empty. Yeah. Yeah. You think that's the key maybe, or notes or what is that and then each one of the little things has its description but again let's just look at the numbers we've only got two minutes we'll come back to maybe to this one look at just the numbers themselves they're different colors but which one is most readable look at the numbers and i know you probably can't read them with the resolution on this on the stream but look at the numbers one through seven tell me which one is the easiest to read and which one is the weakest read? Four is easiest. I agree. Walter says four. Anybody else say four or agree, disagree? And I would probably say next is three or five. And worst is one. Okay. So I got four, five, and seven. Okay. Some of that can be influenced by the stream. <clears throat> Walter said two and seven are hardest. I think one... And two are hardest, and seven, one, two, seven for me. <laughs> Here's the point. There are seven numbers. What is their actual relative merit? Are they supposed to be different, or are they supposed to be the same? What do you think? Do you think one is supposed to be less important than four? One and two are terrible. Oh, we agree. Are they supposed to be the same or are they supposed to be different? I, I, I think the, uh, I think the, yeah, they're, they're labels, right? They're labels. Well, you would assume, here's the thing. You'd assume that one is temporally most important because it starts first, but you would also assume that, that they're all sort of either state transitions or something. And as state transitions, they should all be equal weight, but based on the color, some are easier to read than others. That's just horrible. 
It's horrible. We're out of time. Let's come back to this guy. Maybe we'll wrap up. With, we'll we'll come back to that guy on uh, Monday. And uh, other than that, I am out. Good luck with all the rest of your heavy load stuff. What is that, Landon? Hey, see everybody. So, Landon, what is you have to turn in a a Python file, but only file types accepted are zip. (laughs) Is that like in an actual class? It looks like Canvas. It looks a little canvassy. Nice. Yep. Yeah, the final, what's, oh, sorry, Wes, what was your question? Are you still on, Wes? Yeah, so Wes, I don't know if you can still hear me, but thanks for the reminder on that. And yeah, I'm I'm cool to do something like that. I'm trying to minimize minimize workload for you and for me. Yeah, Seth, hit me up, DM me, and let's find a time. <laughs> Alrighty, okay, I'm gonna shut her down.